It's a striking landscape and strangely beautiful, if only for its vast extent, its solitude, its wilderness. Here you live by the strength of your arm and the courage of your heart, and the very shadow of civilization lies a hundred leagues behind you. In 1846, a young American writer made a journey into the wilds of Wyoming in search of the Plains Indian. His name was Francis Parkman. I was pretty well used to travel. The birch canoe was as familiar to me as a steamboat, and I was as restless as any young man. But that wasn't the only reason I undertook the journey. I wanted to make some inquiries into the character of the remote Indian nations. I'd been curious about them since childhood and having failed to satisfy that curiosity by reading, I resolved to see them for myself. By the 1840s, white Americans had settled only the eastern half of the present USA. Parkman had left civilization behind him. He'd crossed into the great American wilderness, following the Oregon Trail, a route taken by early white explorers into the Wild West. In the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, he reached Fort Laramie, then a lonely outpost of the American Fur Company. Here the traders bought buffalo hides from the local Indian tribes, the Sioux, the Arapaho, the Shoshone, and the Kiowa. Parkman hired a guide here, a French trapper called Raymond, and leaving the safety of these mud-baked walls, they headed further west towards the Laramie Mountains. We passed hill after hill, hollow after hollow, through a country arid, broken, parched by the sun. At length, I heard Ramon shouting. I saw him jump from his mule and examine some object. I rode up to his side and it was the clear and palpable impression of an Indian moccasin. John Noyes is a historical researcher. Following clues in Parkman's book, he's retraced his journey through the Wyoming landscape. Okay, we're driving towards Laramie Peak, and in the near distance is where those bluffs are, the Little Medicine Bow River. The Indian village camps somewhere off to the right. Francis Parkman picked up their trail and made his way to the Laramie River and found the Oglala. As soon as we saw them, they saw us. And several men came forward to greet us, and the ceremony of shaking hands began. The squaw came out and took our horses. And I put aside the leather nap that covered the low opening of the lodge, and I entered the dwelling. And scarcely were we seated before the place was full of Indians who'd come crowding in to see us. The chief, Big Crow, produced his pipe, filled it with a mixture of tobacco and red willow bark, and round and round it passed, and a squaw placed before us a wooden bowl of boiled buffalo meat. Parkman stayed with the Oglala for four weeks, an honored guest. And he recorded a culture unchanged for generations. Like these photographs taken more than 20 years later, he offers a snapshot of Oglala life. As the whole people is divided into bands, so each band is divided into villages. Now each village has a chief who is honored and obeyed only so far as his personal qualities deserve it. Courage and enterprise might raise any warrior to this highest honor. War is the breath of their nostrils. Against most of the neighboring tribes, they cherish a deadly, rancorous hatred passed down from father to son. Many times a year, the great spirit is called upon, the war dance is celebrated, and the warriors go out by handfuls at a time against the enemy.
Hunting and fighting, they wander incessantly through summer and winter. Some follow the herds of buffalo over the waste of prairie. Others traverse the Black Hills, emerging at last upon the parks, those beautiful but most perilous of hunting grounds. The great buffalo hunt was more than an exercise in survival. It was a sacred ritual, as Parkman himself observed. This is where the buffalo hunt took place on July 20th, 1846. The Ogallala with Francis Parkman came up this river, the Little Medicine Bow River. The scouts had gone ahead and found the herd and they were on the opposite slopes of hills signaling with blankets. They surrounded the buffalo herd and Parkman himself, who was too sick to stay on horseback, said that he could not resist the excitement of the hunt. His horse had been bitten by a snake or eaten a poison plant, and yet the horse too was intoxicated by the excitement. We were among them in an instant. Amid the trampling and the yells, I could see their dark figures running hither and thither through clouds of dust. There was uproar and confusion. The buffalo scattering as from a common center. The Indians lashing their horses to furious speed and yelling as they launched arrow after arrow into their sides. Here and there, wounded buffalo swayed and large black carcasses littered the ground. In the late summer of 1846, Parkman returned down the Oregon Trail, leaving behind his so-called savage companions. He had never fully understood them. They remained in his eyes something mysterious, something exotic. But what he did understand all too well was the fate that awaited them. Great changes are at hand in that region. With the stream of emigration to Oregon and California, the buffalo will dwindle away, and the large wandering communities who depend on them for support will be broken and scattered. The Indians will soon be corrupted by the example of the whites, abased by whiskey, overawed by military posts. In a few years, the traveler will pass in safety through their country. But his danger and his charm will have disappeared together. <laughs> 